embryo is growing, right? Again, it starts off as a fertilized zygote, and then that's one cell, but it has to divide, eventually making, you know, like in an adult human, many billions of cells. Okay? And then in an adult animal, okay, you also have to have renewal of tissue. So your cells don't last forever. So for example, you discard huge numbers of blood cells every day. You have lots of cells that come off the lining of your intestine every day, and those have to be replaced. So there has to be a source of cells that are undergoing division to make all of that replacement. So again, the cell division is useful. Uh, we know that for replicating organisms that are single cells, like bacteria. Okay. And then this is an example of early cell division in an embryo. So the blue is the DNA, and the yellow here are the microtubules, which we're going to talk about in a minute, which are responsible for making sure that DNA gets partitioned between the two cells. So this is the first division in an embryo of a sand dollar. Okay. It's quite spectacular looking. Here's an example. Here's a, a sea urchin embryo. Okay. And you see the cells divide. Okay. And that takes just a couple hours. And and then it hatches, not looking yet very much like a sea urchin, because it's going to be a larvae, all right? but it forms a little ball of cells. Here's a more extended process. These are xenopus embryos. So they've divided a couple times already, but they started as one cell. And so they're continuing to divide. The cells get smaller and smaller. They're hard to see. And then you see the embryo beginning to take shape. Okay? And then you'll start looking like a tadpole in a minute. Okay? All right? And then they're going to pop out of the little egg cases. All right? And then they'll go swimming off. All right? So that takes about 20, it, takes, it only takes about a day for that to happen in the case of a tadpole. And it goes from one cell to a couple million cells in that time period. And in this case, a tadpole starts out as a huge cell. The single cell embryo, sorry, is huge, full of yolk. And the cells actually just keep getting smaller and smaller. Okay, as opposed to like you, where the one cell embryo of a human is actually reasonably sized, but of course it's able to take in nutrients and divide without having a huge amount of yolk. But the same thing, cells can go, can, you know, if you have that exponential increase in cells, you can obviously make an enormous number of cells in a relatively small amount of time, depending on how fast you can divide. So in something like a xenopus, the cell division cycle is pretty fast, so it can make an embryo relatively quickly. Okay. And then again, you have this, this pattern of, of uh, renewal of adult cells. So even once you have an adult animal, um, you need to keep replacing cells for homeostasis of your organs and so on. And so generally what you have are cells that are called stem cells. These divide, and they make not only more of themselves, but sometimes they'll divide to make a copy of themselves, but another cell, which actually goes on and divides a few more times, but then differentiates, it becomes something other than the stem cell, actually becomes sort of some sort of specialized cell type. Okay? And here's just one example of that. So in the lining of your intestine, again, you have these intestinal cells that are helping you absorb food, but they get damaged a lot in this process, and so they die and they get sloughed off. So they have to be replaced constantly, huge numbers of them. And the reason that happens is that there are these little crypts in your intestine lining, and in there are these intestinal stem cells, and they divide asymmetrically, making another copy of themselves, but then daughter cells, which then divide and then differentiate into the cells of the lining of the intestine, and that way you can keep going. But then it's very important to have these stem cells. If you run out of these stem cells for some reason or they die off, then you're going to run into a problem very quickly because you won't be able to replace the cells lining your intestine. Okay? Another good example is in the bone marrow. You have bone marrow stem cells that make all of the different types of cells of your, of, of your blood, red blood cells and white blood cells. Okay? okay, so most of the time, though, a cell is sitting in what we call interface. The DNA is, is um, only slightly condensed. It's certainly not condensed in the chromosomes. Okay? And inside the, the, so that's inside, for plants and animals, that's inside a membrane enclosed nucleus. Inside of that is a structure called the nucleolus, which you can often see. That's actually where uh, ribosomal RNA is made. We'll talk more about that later. But a particular kind of RNA is being synthesized. You can often see that. But the DNA is largely un or, or, um, is partially condensed. It's wrapped by histones, but it's not compacted into chromosomes or anything like that. So what's going to happen is that you'll go through what's called the cell cycle in order to really divide a cell. And so what we've really talked about so far is what we call S phase, when DNA synthesis occurs, which is when you make the copy of the DNA in the cell. Uh, but the whole cell cycle itself is composed of a couple other phases, uh, phases. So there's what we call a G1 interface. And this is the time when the cell is usually actively doing whatever it needs to do, making whatever components it needs to make or carrying out various functions. Um, and it's using that DNA as its instructions. Then it undergoes this period of DNA synthesis, and then it pauses again. And at this point, it, it finishes compacting the DNA. Okay? And then it's going to undergo what we call cytokinesis or mitosis. Um, my, sorry, mitosis, where it's actually going to then separate that DNA uh, equally between the two daughters. And then cytokinesis, where it's actually going to separate the two the cell into two cells. Okay? And what we'll do is we'll go through this process step by step. Okay? So again, um, we often show a nucleus of a cell with this chromosome in it saying that well, this is an interface nucleus. But really that's not really correct. And, and your book is pretty good about pointing this out, but it's often drawn that way. The DNA is actually not condensed at this time, but it's easier to understand the idea of one copy of DNA turning into two if we draw it as these little rods. Okay? But in reality, it's actually uh, only partially condensed and to be replicated. In fact, again, it has to be unwound. Okay? So it's unwound to undergo the process of replication. Um, and again, we talked about that. You, know, you get those replication forks and you're going to, to uh, duplicate that double-stranded molecule of DNA into two double-stranded copies. And then as you do that, though, then you actually start to compact it in order to be able to divide the cell. Right? And so at that point, you really compact it together and you make these chromosome structures. But that means that when the chromosomes are put together, they're actually, again, two copies because you don't really compact it until after you've replicated the DNA. So when it compacts, it compacts as two chromosomes, okay? what we call sister chromatids, all right? They're next to each other, all right? Um, okay, so you end up like this. So you have this chromosome, and then you undergo replication, and you end up with these sister chromatids that are actually basically stuck together. There's a protein called cohesin that actually uh, connects the two sister chromatids to each other and keeps them together, all right? So they look like this, all right? So each of these is a giant uh, double-stranded DNA molecule that's wound up with protein. And these two are identical copies. And they have a, a constricted area, which is called a centromere, okay, where they're held together particularly tightly, and the, the significance of that will become obvious in a minute. And then the protein that's between these two sister uh, chromatids is a protein called cohesin. It's holding them together. All right. So now what has to happen is you have to separate these two sister chromatids and send faithfully one copy into each cell. All right. And so that's really the key, is to make sure that each cell ends up with one copy of those two identical chromosomes. And so that's the events of mitosis, and that's what we're going to we'll talk about now. And that's divided into a series of, of stages, okay? And we'll go through them one at a time, all right? But they're called prophase, prometaphase, metaphase, anaphase, and then telophase followed by cytokinesis. So these are the stages, okay? And what I'm going to do is I'm going to walk you through pictures, and I'm going to go through it multiple times, okay, indicating more and more details each time so that you can follow along. So the other components, there's, there's two other components other than DNA that we have to think about um, in order to understand how the cell is going to divide and how it's going to partition these chromosomes accurately. And those two things are shown here. So this is a dividing cell, okay? So you can see the DNA here. That's blue. Those are the chromosomes, okay? And the cell is now already partially divided. 
the red, which hopefully you can see is these fibers that stretch from end to end, are microtubules. Okay, so that's a protein that, that you talked about in chapter six. Okay, and we'll talk about it again in just a minute. And then these bright yellow dots are structures called centrosomes. Okay, and they're a microtubule organizing center. All right. So just to review about what the microtubules are. So remember, these are polymers that form out of monomers of tubulin. Okay, and they form these hollow tubes. They form these sort of cylinders inside the cell. Okay, um, and they can be quite long, and they function to maintain the cell shape, and they also function in cell motility when cells have to move. But what we're going to talk about in this context is that they're also important in chromosome movement, in moving those chromosomes in the cell so that a copy gets into each of the daughters. All right. So that's, the, that's that. Um, and the microtubule organizing center is called the centriole. And the centrioles are two copies of this little, sec of this little pattern of microtubules, specialized microtubules, that are in sort of nine bundles, each one made up of three individual microtubule filaments. Okay? So it's this uh, nine triplet structure, and there are two of them, and they're at right angles to each other. And this is the structure that can organize the microtubules into the rest of the microtubules inside the cell. Okay? So what happens, in, in, so this is in G2 now. So the cell has replicated its DNA. It's still just one cell. It's replicated its DNA, and now it's condensing that DNA into chromosomes. Okay? So that's called the G2 of interphase. Okay? And then it's going to, and I'll go through this quickly, and then we'll go through each one separately in a little more detail. What's going to happen is that the centrosomes, they're going to duplicate. They will have already actually duplicated. And there's two of them, but now they're going to actually march to opposite sides of the cell. They're going to happen in prophase, and then the chromosomes now are condensed together. All right? Then what will happen in pro-metaphase is that the chromosomes, these sister chromatids will be in pairs, and they'll be connected to the centrosomes by microtubules. And there'll be other microtubules that go all the way around that connect to each other. All right? Like I said, we'll, we'll go through each of these in, in a little bit more detail. Uh, and then the chromosomes will line up sort of in the middle here, and then they're going to get pulled apart. So now the cohesin is going to let go, and the two sister chromatids are going to separate, and each one is going to go to a different pole of the cell. Okay? And that way you'll accurately divide up all the chromosomes. And then the cell will actually divide, the nuclear envelope will reform, and the DNA will decondense. Okay? And the result will be that you'll take in one cell, duplicate its DNA, divide it into two, and make sure that each daughter has the same DNA in it. Okay? One copy of each DNA molecule. So now we'll go through again step by step, showing you a real cell each time. Okay. So you've got here um, G2 of interface. So the DNA is not condensed into chromosomes yet. Okay, there's a nuclear envelope still, and you've got this. Uh, so the centrosomes have divided, but they're still next to each other. Okay, and there's still a identifiable nucleolus in there, and again the nuclear envelope is intact. So that's cells divided. All the DNA is getting ready to divide. All right. So the next step will be that these two centrosomes start to move apart. Okay, they're just barely moving apart here, but they're organizing all these microtubules between them. So all of these tubulin fibers are stretching between these centrosomes. Okay? And then some also stretch the other way towards the periphery of the cell. And at this point, the nuclear envelope is breaking down, okay? and the DNA is condensing into chromosomes. Okay? And the chromosomes are sister chromatids. Right? There's actually two copies of the DNA um, next to each other. Okay. The next phase is this pro-metaphase, where now you get these beautiful chromosomes that you can see. Okay? And the nuclear envelope is gone. The centrosomes are at opposite sides. Okay? And there are these uh, microtubules. Some of them go to each other around and connect to each other. Others go actually to the chromosome and connect to the centromere of the chromosome or that constricted part of the chromosome. So individual microtubules will come and be connected to those. Okay? And they'll line up. And what will happen after a while is that each chromosome will have a connection to each of the centrosomes. So they'll juggle back and forth until the chromosomes get lined up in the middle here, called the metaphase plate. It's not a, a real physical structure. It's just that midline where the chromosomes will get jostled to until they line up. So here in this cell, we've got whatever, like six chromosomes are shown here, this, this uh, maple leaf cell. Here's one that's a lot more chromosomes. And so the centrosomes, again, are opposite poles. And what you see is that for every chromosome, there's filaments coming from this centrosome and this centrosome. And they connect there in that centromere. Okay? So a little bit blown up view. Right? So these microtubules connecting to the centrosomes. They connect in a structure called the kinetochore. So this is at that uh, centromere, that condensed point. There's these proteins here. And those microtubules are connected there. Okay? And then they connect to the centrosomes. Okay? And now the chromosomes are all lined up. Yeah. So the asters are those star patterns of the microtubules. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. So now the next step then is to start pulling the chromosomes apart. Okay. So now the cohesin breaks down, and the two sisters are not stuck to each other anymore. All right. And the microtubules start pulling. Okay. And we'll talk in a minute about how they're able to pull. But they pull. Okay. And now you can imagine that right. You have the sister chromatids, and they're connected to each of the centrosomes. But now the cohesin breaks down, and so when they pull, the two sisters come apart. Okay. But remember, the sisters are identical to one another. They are the two replicated molecules. Right. They pull apart, and each one heads towards the opposite centrosome. All right. And so in that way, you're able to start to partition the DNA accurately between what are going to be the two daughter cells. Okay, so one way we can tell how they're actually moving is an experiment that's shown here. So what you can do, one of the things we can do is we can actually fluorescently label the microtubules so that they would glow okay, under a fluorescent under a microscope called fluorescent microscope. And then we can take a beam of light and we can create a shadow. We can ble basically we're bleaching it. So we shine so much light that that fluorescent molecule starts to uh, decay, and so it's not as bright anymore. It doesn't actually bother the tubulin. Okay, it's not breaking it or anything. It's just making it dimmer. So we can create that line, and then we can watch as the chromosomes start moving. What happens to that uh, darkened line that we have? So you can imagine one possibility is that dark stripe would move backwards. Okay? which would indicate that the microtubules are getting shorter because they're, the ends of them are being chewed away here and they're being pulled back. Okay? But that's not what you see. That line stays at the same place. So that means that the tubulin is getting shorter at this end, at the chromosome end. Okay? And that's shown here. So the microtubules connected. And then there's motor proteins. These are molecules called myosins, things like that, that connect the kinetic core to the microtubule. And they ratchet back, pulling the chromosome along the microtubule towards the centrosome. Okay? So, and as they do that, okay, this end of the microtubule gets degraded, and the tubulin subunits come apart, and it depolymerizes at that end. Okay? So that process is what's pulling it back. And that's why the chromosomes end up in these sort of V-shapes, because they're being pulled from right here. Okay? But they're being pulled because motors there are just chugging along, moving it this way on the microtubule, and then the microtubule is being severed off, the subunits are being taken back apart, and the microtubule is getting shorter and shorter, and the chromosomes are headed in this direction. Okay? And so that same thing happens on both sides. Okay? And then eventually, then, the chromosomes will reach the two different poles, and then the cell will actually divide, and the nuclear envelope will reform, and the DNA will decondense. Okay? So that's the last step, is cytokinesis. So you've now pulled the DNA to the two poles, now you actually have to pinch the cell into two. And that works in different
It's a little bit different in plants. So in plants, you uh, have the DNA go to the opposite ends, and then you actually synthesize a cell wall between those. So what happens is that little vesicles that make cell walls will start to line up at the middle here, where it wants to divide, and they'll fuse together and they'll form a new cell wall that will divide the two daughters from each other. Okay? And you can, you can see that process here okay? for, for a plant cell, where again, it's the same sort of thing that the nuclear envelope breaks down, the DNA is condensed, they line up at metaphase, they get pulled apart, and then a cell wall gets synthesized between them. Okay? So we'll go ahead and end there for today. Right?